Thank you. So you can hear me, the mic's on? Great, thank you. Okay, so yes, serverless servers. I'm Matt, uh, he's Tom, like, uh, the, like we were introduced, we work for Oracle, but I haven't always been a software engineer. When I took uh, my degree, I was studying mechanical engineering and I had a placement job working here. Does anyone know this? No, this is Sellafield Nuclear Waste Reprocessing Plant in Cumbria. Uh, and the job we had, uh, which I still think is like super interesting, is we were looking for tiny leaks in really long pipes. And uh, the pipes have cladding, leaks in the nuclear waste, don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> so the pipes are really long, they have cladding, they go through and under, and they're very complicated, and you can't just visually inspect them. So we had this thing where what we do, we'd seal off a section of the pipe, drill a hole at either end, use pumps to suck the air out, and then plug the holes with this putty that had microphones in it. And then just wait and listen uh, from either end for the sound of this air rushing in through uh, the cracks in the, in the pipe, and then use some kind of Fourier analysis machinery to work out the delay in the sound of the hissing reaching each microphone. We could triangulate where the leaks were, and we could find multiple leaks at once, and we could pinpoint these things across hundred meters, hundreds of meters of pipes to, uh, you know, within a couple of centimeters. It was actually kind of surprisingly accurate. And it was fun climbing up and down the ladders and putting on a boiler suit and a radiation counter and, and <laughs> squirming around. It was fun. Um, and it was a funny job uh, to have as well, working for the CEGB, which is the Central Electricity Generating Board, the thing at the, the organization that maintained and ran all the power stations in the country. Because uh, for his whole career, my dad worked for the CEGB. And so I also have memories of like going to Oldbury. Does anyone know Oldbury Nuclear Power Station? Right, it's about 20 kilometers north of here. And I used to have to go there sometimes as a kid. And uh, obviously the security guards don't just wave you into these enormous industrial danger zones. Um, <laughs> so I had to wait in reception. And I've got these really strong memories because I had to do it a few times. They used to show me videos whilst I was waiting in the visitor center um, for my dad. And I remember specifically a couple of videos. There was one where it was like a cartoon. And um, let me know if, if this rings any bells for you because you might have seen it. There's like a cartoon of control rods being lowered into a reactor to control its speed. And the control rods were like grabbing neutrons and stuffing them in their mouths. And um, that was, yeah, that, was, that sticks there. But actually, my favorite video was uh, a video which is now on YouTube, obviously, uh, about a thing called Operation Smash Hit which is like the 80s literal naming scheme uh, for things. So I'm just going to like tee up this video. So what they did uh, with these control rods, we just, no, oh, stop. Right, OK. So the control rods, once they were used up, they were very hot. They got put in big pools of water to cool off. And after a few months, they got loaded up into these things. It's a little blurry, maybe, but these are flasks. And they would take uh, the control rods in these giant metal flasks over road and rail networks to Sellafield, where they would be reprocessed. So this is like dangerous nuclear waste that people obviously, there was a lot of public fear about it being uh, spilled or the environmental damage. And politicians obviously reflected the public's fear. So has anyone seen this video before? Great. Everyone else, you're in, well, you're in for a treat too. But um, so what they did, right? <laughs> they, uh, they put on some 80s music. They got, they got a tank, uh, one of these flasks, right? They upended it on its side, uh, and they like smashed a, an actual full-size train into it, at, um, like over 100 miles an hour, to demonstrate that. Uh, I'll pause it here because the music's a bit much. It's like a full-size locomotive. I don't know how much they weigh. Tens of tons, hundreds of tons. Four passenger carriages, no passengers. But they just like. <laughs> smashed it in. And this, is, this worked, right? They, they ended up using road and rail network to transport these flasks around the country up to Sellafield. Uh, and it was incredibly expensive, right? In 80s pounds, this still cost millions. Um, and in like 2018 pounds, that's also millions, but it's a few more. Um, but electricity, right? Even back then and these days, electricity, you don't think of it as being terribly expensive, right? You turn on and off lights, and you don't think, oh, God, like, I better not leave this one. Perhaps you do. But it's not tremendously expensive electricity compared to the cost of smashing a full-size train into a thing. And electricity is also kind of simple, isn't it? I haven't got one to hand, but a light switch, you just flick it right on and off. But 
Uh, you probably get the impression from my thing about climbing up and down ladders and sticking microphones in pipes like power stations aren't simple. No, not at all. And they're not even the whole puzzle, right? There's uh, between power stations and consumers of electricity, there's this giant distribution network called the National Grid, uh, and that decouples power supplies from uh, consumers. There's electricity imported in big wires from France. There's this thing in uh, North Wales where they've hollowed out the inside of a mountain. It's called Electric Mountain. When there's a surplus of electricity, they pump water up into this big reservoir. And when there's a surplus of demand, they sluice the water back down and it drives the pumps backwards and they act like turbines. And there's this like, enormously complex um, system of these huge industrial projects that make electricity seem cheap and uh, very, very simple to use, right? Just on and off. You don't have to really think about all that stuff. So anyway, as much as I enjoy talking about it, you probably didn't come for a talk about power stations and tra trains. Maybe. I don't know. I'll carry on if you want. No. Serverless, right? So um, excuse me. Right. So how many people here, Bristech, Tech, have a job or a hobby which in some way involves using or creating software? <laughs> Great. Um, OK, you do, right? <laughs> I was going to ask what you did. Um, yeah, sure, we all do, right? We, cr we create software, Oracle, and your companies probably. You rely on software. Your customers rely on the software that you use. But this is 2018, right? And uh, the cloud has been around for over a decade now. And it's getting to the point where owning, running, and maintaining your own servers because you have a business need to run software sort of makes an equivalent amount of sense to owning maintaining and running your own kind of power generators because you happen to need electricity. You want to be able to consume it simply. And the, the trend over the last decade and more has been abstraction uh, away from end users to uh, providers who provide things as a commodity. And then the providers do things at enormous scale and then are able to use the economies of scale to provide uh, very cheap and ideally you know, simple uh, you sort of user experience for people who want to um, use to run software, and our, I know, my uh, thesis, right? Our thesis is that serverless is really like the furthest we've gone along this path so far. Uh, it's going to carry on, and Tom and I work uh, together at Oracle, and we worked on a serverless platform there. And we'd like to tell you a little bit about the kind of industrial engineering that goes on behind the scenes there to make it seem simple and cheap for end users. And so I'm going to hand right over to Tom. Does this clicker work? No, you need to click away from the video. Right, and we'll bring it right back to uh, data centers and, and, and hardware. Hi, folks. Um, so yeah, serverless means many things to many people. It's a, it's a broad church, and just as the provision of electricity involves many components, many platforms, <laughs> So does a serverless architecture. We're going to focus in on one aspect of that today, which is a function. Now, the contract that a functions as a service platform honors is really simple, right? You give us your code and some cash, and we provide somewhere for your code to run, provide somewhere for your code to run, and we provide you with a way for you to invoke your code. Sounds easy, right? Um, and it is easy to do it for one person if that person doesn't care about safety, speed, reliability, um, or cost, particularly. So um, how do we do this at scale whilst maintaining those characteristics? That's the really interesting question. Doing this for one person is not particularly interesting. So we'll have a little sidebar about the industrialization of, um, of standards, right? When we saw the electricity industry industrialize um, and and, and start providing as a commodity, you know, you have these, these sockets, right? Think of all of the different things that you can plug into one of those sockets, essential and trivial, that would not have been possible without this electricity generation and distribution infrastructure. So having this standard that you can, that you can apply has enabled innovation in front of the standard. But it's also enabled innovation behind the standard on the supply side. So uh, like our friends at OVO are doing really interesting things with uh, renewable supply. There's interesting things happening about new battery storage techniques in the, on the supply side. So by having this standard, it uncouples producers from consumers and allows innovation on both sides. 
we're going to see the, the same thing. I, I, my theory is that we're going to see the same thing happening in the serverless space. Um, and I'm looking forward to some interesting innovation and competition on the supply side. So with that in mind, what we're going to show you now is just one way of meeting this functions as a service contract. It's a way that works for us right now, but there's going to be uh, lots of advances and changes on this over the coming years. So to illustrate this question, we're going to, ask, to illustrate this point, we're going to ask the question, how many servers have to exist so that you can run a serverless function? Right? That's easy. One, you care about safety, speed, uh, and reliability. So in order to talk about how we think about this, I think uh, we first need to understand how we think about isolation. So how do we isolate your code from somebody else's? Code is dangerous, right? Somebody else's. Code is dangerous, right? Other people's code, doubly so. So we need to make sure that your code is isolated, very strongly isolated, from um, everybody else's. We think the minimum bar here is hardware level um, isolation. So this is taking advantage of things like um, Intel VT or AMD V or ARM Trust Zone um, ex uh, CPU extensions. That means virtualization, right? So how do we, how do we, um, how does our functions platform provision these units of isolation, these virtual machines? So I need to introduce you to our first component, the pool manager. So the pool manager manages a fleet of VMs, right? We call these, we call these VMs uh, runners. Uh, it keeps track of the, uh, and because we insist that we have a VM isolation in between customers, we have, our pool manager has to track the demand for runners per customer, right? Um, so it's tracking uh, capacity per customer. Um, it's maintaining a pool of VMs, and it is then, as, uh, it, as it decides it needs to make more capacity available to a customer, it will pick a VM from the pool, and it will specialize it for that customer. So what that basically means is plumbing it into the customer's networks uh, and allowing that to access customer resources. Um, one thing we will never do is once a runner has been specialized for a customer and has run customer code, we will never reuse that runner uh, for another customer that runner will uh, eventually get retired either due to lack of use or due to old age. So therefore, the pool manager also has to boot more VMs to replenish this VM pool as it, as it drains them down, uh, as it specializes them for um, customers. And we do that using our infrastructure APIs, which I'm going to talk to you a bit more about later. Obviously, our pool manager, we, obviously, we want to do this in a reliable way and at scale. So our pool manager has to be a highly available service. We run three minimum of three copies. Uh, it's active, passive. We do a leader election, and we share state between them. More, more on the details of that later. OK, so we have, we have a secure sandbox um, that is specialized for a particular customer. So we've got secure isolation of your code from other people's code. How do we provide you with a way to invoke that? And how do we track the demand for those, uh, for those execution environments? So we need to introduce the FNLB uh, component. So, uh, and there are many of these as well. I should have drawn more boxes here. There are, there are, there are many of these. Um, what these do is they expose an HTTPS endpoint that you can call with or without any data that your function might need, uh, and it will select a runner from the set of runners that are available for your customer, and it will forward that invocation onto that runner. Okay? So, the, so the load balancer needs to know about all of the VMs that are specialized for a customer, and it does that by listening to a feed that's broadcast from the pool manager. In return, the pool manager needs to know about what the demand are for particular customers' functions so that it can specialize new runners ahead of time before they're needed and replenish the VM pool at a rate that makes sense for them. So the, the, the pool manager and the load balancer cooperate to track and meet customer demand for uh, an individual function um, running. OK, so we have, I mentioned that we have many of these functions load balancers. How do we present that as one coherent endpoint to your, to your users, uh, to you as users? Um, the answer is that we have a network load balancer. This is, a, um, this is a layer 7 network load balancer. 
um, fairly standard component in many infrastructure uh, clouds today, and our, our cloud is no different. It has one of these services. This is an external service to our functions thing, right? So we can call into this service to get a load balancer. We run many of those load balancers, and we round robin DNS in front of those to provide you with the endpoint that you can uh, use to call your function. Okay, so how do you tell us about your code and where it is and where you want to hook it up to? And how do you find out about the endpoint where we've exposed, uh, that invoke endpoint that we've exposed for you to call? Well, we have an API. And this lets you manage the, the, the FN domain objects, right? These are things like um, apps, functions, triggers, config for your function. So your, our CLI tooling and our web UI interact with this um, public UI, uh, with this public API. Um, but you can also use it from a CI CD system or a software delivery system like Atomist um, to automate your software, uh, software lifecycle. So, you tell your API where your code is, um, where is your code such that you can put it there and the, and the server can, and the system can read it, answer in an image registry. Um, again, this is another service that's external to us um, that we use. So our CLI tooling will um, build your code, wrap it in a, a container image and push it to this image registry. This is uh, simply a Docker registry that's private for your own use. Um, so our tooling builds, wraps, and pushes the container image to your registry, and then it tells the API where it's just pushed to, so that the API can hook up the, the code to the endpoint in the load balancer. One thing, we, one thing we're very good at doing is keeping our execution path, a hot path, separate from our management path. Uh, so this is a common pattern we see in, a, in almost all of our services, is that we have a control plane which is kept very separate from the data plane. And um, we have a couple of components here, the streamer and the snapper, which are responsible for synchronizing state um, from the control plane to the, to the data plane. And this is a really important pattern for, uh, for safety and for reliability. Um, and Matt's gonna tell you a little bit more about, uh, about this in some detail, Matt. Oh, well, right now? Right okay. Now. Uh, no problem. So, uh, before I uh, move on, I'll just uh, mention the kind of design language that I've chosen to scribble out here is the circles are in sort of services and red boxes represent uh, servers, right? So every time we're adding a red box, we're adding one or more of us. So plane, data planes, region, what does a serv so what does a service look like? It's like I just told you, it's a circle. <laughs> um, and like Tom told you, it's split into two parts, the data plane and the control plane. Uh, this is terminology that's been borrowed from software-defined networking, where the control plane is, the, is the, the sort of infrastructure that knows the whole topology of the network, and in response to people deciding what ingress and outgress, egress rules should be, egress rules should be, will design uh, individual routing tables for each of the network components, and then the data plane is the network components that deal with high velocity, high throughput, very low latency stuff. So they have different concerns, uh, you know, public facing data, high throughput, low latency. You can maybe tolerate some higher latency uh, in the control plane because it's only humans that are waiting, uh, not packets. All right, so in terms of the service uh, model then, how we've um, sort of taken that model and applied it to the services in our data centers, what goes in the control plane is typically an API, like Tom mentioned, you can create a function, you design, you tell us, you know, here's a function, here's the image I'd like you to use, you maybe create a trigger for it or that kind of thing, and then there's some orchestration piece, and what the orchestrator does in the control plane is it creates things in the data plane side, right, and then they're responsible for actually running the function. So all the stuff Tom was talking about with the runners and that kind of stuff and the pool manager, that's all data plane stuff, and once this is set up, there's no dependency back to the control plane, right, we can't put control plane in the path of the high throughput, low latency data. Right? So in theory, although I don't know how, <laughs> how much we've tested this completely, the control plane could fall off the face of the earth and the data plane still run, right? You just wouldn't be able to change it because there's no API to talk to. And where do services run? On servers, obviously. And where are servers? Well, they're um, on the earth somewhere. <laughs> in, 
in uh, what, what, is, what we call and what other public clouds call regions. And a region is a geographical area. We have regions in Phoenix, Washington, London, other places around the world. Uh, regions are independent from each other. Typically, if, uh, if we're talking about a service, it's a, they are called regional services. Most of our services are regional. So if you create a function in one region, it only exists in that region. If you want it to be in every region, you have to push it there yourself. Uh, you might choose a region based on locality to users, low latency. You might have compliance restrictions about where data is allowed to reside. You know, it can't leave the country for, for legal reasons, that kind of thing. Uh, and what's inside a region? Availability domains. And an availability domain concretely is, concretely, a data center, right? a big building, uh, or like suite of buildings. Uh, they are far enough apart that uh, some kind of calamitous event, like a, a fire or a power cut or something, can only affect one at a time. But they're close enough together that the uh, privately owned backbone fiber interconnects between them can give you sub-millisecond latency between them. So they're sort of tens of kilometers apart, not that I'm expecting you to kind of drive it anyway, anytime soon. Um, Y3, so this is going back to our uh, safety and resilience story. Let's say we would like to do an upgrade of this one. So briefly take this one down to uh, stop traffic going to it. We still need high availability and disaster prevention kind of things across the other two. Uh, or, like less happily, maybe there is actually a disaster and one of them's gone. We've still got high availability, high availability across the other two. Three is also a good number for leadership elections, certain quorum sort of finding algorithms will need at least three places. Uh, so... Typically, everything that's in a control plane or most things that are in a data plane, not everything, but a lot of things in a data plane, need to exist across all three ADs. Uh, There's an interesting fact, actually. I only learned this yesterday. What I think of as AD1 and what you think of in a as a different customer think of as AD1 might not be the same one. They might be numbered differently. And this prevents the problem, like, everyone obviously puts everything in AD1, because why wouldn't you? And then if everyone thinks AD1 is the same data center, that one gets out of capacity first. And then, so they're, they're, there's only three, but they're numbered differently according to the customer. It's an interesting little fact. Um, okay, so anyway, control plane and data plane stuff usually has to exist in all three regions, which means a service actually looks like this, right, with three copies of everything. Well, let's say you can merge the API and the orchestration piece into a single server. And perhaps there's not two different services in the data plane, depends. But at a bare minimum, in order for a service to exist, there are six, oh, I haven't got enough fingers, six separate servers running, right? Because they're across in different data centers, and then the control plane and data plane are split onto different networks, and we, we wouldn't reuse the hardware for that. Okay, so we probably won't mention this again, but every time you see a service on the, on the diagram that uh, Tom's going to flick back to you next, uh, imagine that it actually looks like this and there's a lot more servers than we're actually drawing for you. So, Tom, as I mentioned, talked about runners. How do they get there, Tom? I'm going to tell you a bit about our infrastructure services. Um, so, infrastructure services, I, I'm imagining most of you have used a public cloud. H hands up if you haven't used a public cloud. No, no, no hands. No one willing to admit it anyway. Um, so. You're broadly familiar with the concept of being able to call an API and get uh, compute storage or networking infrastructure stuff provisioned for you. Um, that's not particularly interesting. We, we have all of those things in our platform as well, right? Just like every other public cloud. Um, there are a couple of differences in our infrastructure services, though, that make our job of building a FAS platform easier. So I just want to highlight a couple of those. Um, so where are we? Yes, we are uh, an infrastructure service. So it's an infrastructure service. Um, as Matthew has just very nicely outlined for us, we have a control plane and a data plane. Um, in our control plane, we have a bunch of different APIs. The, one we're the ones we're really interested in um, as functions developers, as developers on the functions service, is the compute API and the net API. The, we can give these APIs commands like boot us a server or attach a network interface to this, this customer's network, that kind of thing. And these, these APIs will then uh, talk to our data planes uh, in the infrastructure services to make that happen. Um, nothing too groundbreaking there. What's really different about our infrastructure is that we've built it from the ground up to be a bare metal infrastructure. 
right? So you can go and ask one of these APIs for a bare metal server, and you're going to get a whole server with no Oracle control software running, it, running on it at all attached to your own private network, um, potentially with your, own, uh, with your own private disks as well. This, this, is, this, this design, design decision made early on has had a couple of really interesting um, impacts, which makes my life as a developer on functions easier. So for, first of all, there's no, there's no hypervisor on a bare metal. So how do we do network virtualization and how do we do storage virtualization? Well, we've had to push uh, both, of those, both of those things off into the network fabric itself. Right, so our network fabric takes care. So all of, all of the disks that are presented to our servers are iSCSI, internet SCSI devices, right? Um, and we have a block storage service that presents uh, iSCSI um, targets that our servers can, uh, can talk to. Um, and even our boot volumes are done over iSCSI, right? We don't have any local boot disks on our server because um, Quite frankly, that's a terrifying prospect. Um, if, if, you're, if you're getting a bare metal machine that somebody else has just used, you want to be able to trust that. Um, so, so boot disks are all over iSCSI. Um, but surely the performance is going to suck because you're doing all of your I.O. over a network. Um, and this was the second, the second thing that we've had to do due to our deciding to make this a bare metal cloud is that we've had to provision an incredibly capable network. Um, uh, behind the scenes. So each bare metal instance gets two separate 25 gigabit um, NICs exposed to it. And the network that those NICs are connected to is a fully connected spine and leaf topology that we don't um, overcommit at all. So there is no contention on our network at all on the, on the physical substrate of the network. We fully provide, so you can guaranteed get that full bandwidth between any two hosts in an availability domain. Spine and leaf topology lets us keep that, top, keep that network really flat, which lets us keep our latency really low as well. So we're typically seeing like 100 microseconds average latency between any two hosts in an availability domain, and about 500 microseconds um, between uh, availability domains. Um, but not everybody needs, so these servers are big, right? These servers are 256 or 512 gigabytes of RAM. Not everybody needs uh, that much RAM in one go or wants to pay for it. So we also offer a way to slice this up in a more traditional um, virtualized network. So you can order VMs from our API and get them in the same way. They're exposed in exactly the same way as our, as our um, bare metal instances. So you can get bare metal in the same way you can get VMs. They'll boot, boot off the same images. Um, and all of the devices look similar. We also go, th go to great lengths to um, isolate you from noisy neighbor effects. Um, this talk is a bit too short to talk in detail about that, but I'm around all afternoon and very, very happy to bore you about. Uh, so you recognize it all in the jumper as well. Yeah, uh, I may not be wearing this jumper after this talk. <laughs> it's really hot. Um, OK. So how, how is this used by our, our functions platform? Well, as we mentioned at the top, the pool manager uses the compute APIs to boot uh, isolated sandboxes into its VM pool. And then when we specialize those runners, uh, those runners for a customer, we're using the net API to, um, to attach the, uh, the, the virtual network interface from the VM into the customer's network. And in case you're wondering, this little, uh, this little wart on the side of the bare metal instance represents the, the network virtualization, the off-box network, <coughs> network virtualization. Um, and at this point, I'm going to hand over to Matthew, who's going to tell you a little bit about how we manage state in our service. Yeah, so who's uh, worked with storing data at scale here? A few people. And out of those, who thinks it's like an easy problem? Because <laughs> <laughs> we are hiring. Um, so, okay, so we've already seen in this picture so far a couple of uh, services which specifically exist to store data and make it available, right? The block storage is like disk over like a SCSI thing, target, iSCSI target as a service. Image registry is about storing container images. But actually, the image registry doesn't store the data itself. 
it just provides that kind of front end that looks like a Docker registry, but it actually stores things in an object store. I hope you can read that. It's a little small. This is an object store. The um, contract for an object store, they're uh, quite common foundational services in cloud infrastructure. You just put some data there, and it gives you a an URL, and you can pull that data back uh, when you want, and it can be like quite large blobs of data. But there's not really any kind of complex querying or any kind of querying, really. It's just like, get me, give me back the thing I gave you earlier. Um, <coughs> So that's used by the image registry behind the scenes. It'll, come, it'll make an appearance again later. Uh, Tom mentioned as well the public API in the functions control plane up there uh, allows you to create functions, to create applications, which are kind of groups of functions, to create triggers, uh, to define configuration. There's a kind of domain model for uh, the function service, and that's stored in a key value store, which is for more structured data, allows some kinds of querying, uh, and typically kind of smaller blobs. So there are different types of data, different requirements about um, consistency and availability, so we use a different service for it. Uh, what was next? Okay, cool. The um, changes that come in through the public API, Tom touched on this briefly at the start, are sent through the streamer directly to FNLB. So this is like an event source model for the load balancers to understand that domain model as well. They get like a stream of this has changed, this has changed, this has changed, this has changed. But obviously when you bring up a new instance of an FNLB, you don't want to be uh, replaying everything from the start of history. You want to take occasional snapshots. So we've got an imaginative naming scheme. I don't know, has it changed since the 80s? Uh, Snapper, <laughs> which stores snapshots of state, and they go into the object store. So a new FNLB can read the latest snapshot of state from the object store and then start receiving these uh, the streaming data from the streamer. So there's different, yeah, different types of data, different places that it's stored. We have a streaming service. Uh, this, if you think of uh, a Kafka-esque API, uh, is used by the active-passive configuration of pool managers for those, for those three to keep in sync. So if the active one dies, the passive ones can take over and have exactly the same view of the world, right? So five data storage services. What's next? Oh, my God, there's another one. Key management is uh, a, a very different type of uh, data. We have very strong compliance restrictions about how to store secrets. Uh, so secrets being customer secrets, uh, cryptographic certificates, etc. So key management has uh, some custom hardware security modules where the data is encrypted at rest. And as well as customer secrets and this kind of thing, uh, key management is responsible for maintaining the certificates that we use so that all the services, every communication that we've talked about so far, and all the ones we're going to talk about, use mutual TLS, right? So communication between these services is encrypted, uh, certificates are rotated frequently, and the certificates live in key management. So this is expensive hardware for <laughs> storing data encrypted at rest. This is one of the like things you definitely don't want to have to own yourself unless you're mega rich. Um, so it's complicated, right? Storing state, you were right. Whoever put their hands up earlier. Um, phew. There's obviously like more and more, depending on um, what, uh, you know, if you have any other kinds of, of needs along the CAP kind of triad. But this is like the minimum set of state services that we use for running a function. Talk about how we uh, ensure security and observability across the function service. I would love to, Matthew. Oh, great. Um, so, to Matthew. Oh, great. Um, so, secur security and observability. Well, you've, you've already um, done part of my job by talking about the key management service, um, which we use to store um, key material and perform cryptographic operations for us. Uh, but that's not all that you need for safety and security, right? There's a bunch more, a bunch more stuff that we need to do. So, we're going to talk about some of the some of the services we rely on to provide um, to provide security. Um, first up, and very importantly, is the identity service here. This is actually one of the few, perhaps the only, service in our cloud that is global rather than regional. So we actually replicate data uh, from our identity service globally across all of our regions. Uh, the, the folks that, that work here have a really tough time. They're the only service that can take down multiple regions if they fuck up, mm -hmm. if they screw up. Um, <laughs> Keep swearing, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what, what does the identity service identity service do, it does um, authorization and authentication. So we, we do authentication on every incoming customer request. 
uh, and we have a request signing mechanism that, that's probably familiar to folks who've integrated with APIs before. You sign every request with your private key and we validate that that matches the public key you've given us. Um, and that is what is used to uniquely identify you as a user. Then we'll perform an authorization call uh, and that will identify whether that user is able or has the necessary permissions to access the resource that that operation uh, pertains to. We have and we expose quite a rich DSL for describing these policy statements that lets you get down to a really fine-grained level of control on who can do what and when. Um, slightly related, we have the, the quota service. I say slightly related because this also is, is also used to gate requests coming into our platform. So this does things like managing, managing rate limits, it manages scale, um, it allows us to manage our scale, it can ensure fair use of resources between customers, um, and we also use this service to do uh, whitelisting and feature flagging of, of new stuff as we, as we deploy it um, for, for customers or, and so on. Um, audit service does exactly what it says on the tin. We send events there. They get logged for posterity in, a, um, in an uncorruptible log. Um, and then you as a user can query that later on to see what went on. So if you're trying to work out how on earth this function got deleted, you can go into your audit log uh, and find out exactly who did that and when and what permissions they had uh, at that point in time. This is super useful to anyone who uh, has like compliance um, uh, type requirements. Um, so next up, we have a pair of services that are kind of, kind of coupled, log logging and metrics. So these are the services that let us see what's going on in our systems. We don't want to be crawling around our data centers, drilling holes into network cables and putting microphones in them. Um, wire taps. Oh, yeah. Wire taps. Um, so, so we instrument, ev everything here is instrumented. We have sensors all over our code and they're sending um, measurements to our metric services all the time. And similarly with logging, that gives us a, the, every one of these services does structured logging and every request results in a, in a log entry in our logging system. These are the systems that we, that we have a kind of love-hate relationship with because we can also set alerts on, um, on logging or on our metrics that will wake us up at 3 a.m. when stuff is going wrong or is about to go wrong. Um, but it's not just the it's not just the services that enable us to offer a, a secure and, s and safe platform, right? There's a bunch of ways of working that that help us, and a bunch of other engineering that needs to happen out of the band of these of these things that are running on hardware, right? We didn't have to crash a train in order to uh, provide you with electricity, but we had to crash a train in order to demonstrate or test that that was safe. So we have a bunch of working practices and processes that help us uh, deliver a safe and secure service as well. So I'm thinking about things here like red team exercises where our offensive security teams will have a go at um, hacking our service and um, feed back to us where we might need to shore up our security. We have things like ops games days where we'll split the teams in two and one half will try and take the service down, the other half will try and keep it up. <laughs> Ref, uh, like, like chaos engineering, we do a bit of chaos engineering as well from which referenced in the talk, uh, in the talk earlier. Um, and you also need to have really good incident response and management processes such that you can deal with whatever's happening to you at the moment, but also learn from that so that you don't make the same mistakes again. So there's a bunch of other things outside of the direct software and hardware that we need to make the soft, the, the, this safe and reliable, uh, a bunch of human factors that we, that we need to take into account as well. Okay, Yo. Matthew's going to talk to us about ingress service. Sure, you've noticed that this picture is getting rather full, but there's a little bit of space up in the top left that I can fill. Um, so Tom's, Tom said, right, that uh, a user request can hit this load balancer and it will go through FNLB in, onto a runner and then into the function. Uh, and that's fine, that's one way of doing it, but uh, often you'll want more control. You'll want to put other things in front of that. Uh, and these are typically... Uh, captured in things like API gateway, or if you think gateway is a single word, then you can call it a pig. Um, <laughs> I like that. Um, 
And this does things like rate limiting, caching. We can do auth offload so that, uh, for example, instead of using the identity service down here, you might want to do login with GitHub or that kind of thing. Uh, there's SSL termination at this point as well, and that's very CPU intensive, which is why I put two little red blocks up there. Um, then, once SSL termination has happened, there's the opportunity for a web application firewall, which can do things like looking for SQL injection attacks. It can inspect HTTP headers. Look, oh, sorry, looking for uh, cross-site scripting, that kind of uh, bot detection. People who are just probing for vulnerabilities can be blocked at that level. Right. So those ingress services exist as well. This is, as far as we have uh, enumerated, the minimum set of servers and services that we run in Oracle Cloud in order for Sorry, your... I think, <laughs> I think our time's up, Matt. Oh, no. no. In order for uh, you to call uh, the thing that you're running on it serverless. Uh, what uh, a typical architecture diagram has that this one doesn't yet is lines between the boxes. So here are the ones we've talked about, <laughs> right? And uh, the big green one is like the actual user request coming in. Things like this, like every service talks to this, so I haven't bothered drawing all of them. And we've made it to the end of the talk without even mentioning the K word, right? Kubernetes is used, <laughs> we haven't talked about it, but it is used by the orchestration in the control plane to bring things up in the data plane, and it's used by our deployment technology to bring things up in the control plane. So that's firstly, it's another service. I don't know where to put it. Secondly, like it connects all over the place to everything and is subject to exactly the same kind of constraints that we were talking about. So another, another thing we haven't mentioned is the physical engineering of data centers. These things really are as big and complex uh, on the same kind of order of magnitude as power stations, right? And the things that we build and the plumbing and the wiring and everything really is approaching that level of complexity. But power stations have been around in, I think the first one in the UK was in Newcastle in the 1880s, right? So they've got 100 plus years of uh, evolutionary history. Now, uh, data centers, you know, very big data centers and cloud is perhaps approaching its second decade. And if you can imagine what a data center and what a compute infrastructure kind of system will look like when we're at that kind of age of 100 plus years, it's not gonna look anything like this, right? We're not gonna call what we do serverless, but we're moving towards that abstraction and industrialization of compute, and this is like part of what's going on behind the scenes uh, in that effort. So thank you all, I guess, for staying and listening, and uh, hopefully you enjoyed the talk. Uh, he's Tom, he's been Tom. Come and uh, ask us questions, or I'm gonna move between you and Lance. Questions, or um, move between you and Lance. Find us, I will be wearing the jumper later. Find us, I will be wearing the jumper later. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, um, so what, what, what I forgot to say at the start is it's fantastic that Oracle are sharing this level of depth and insight into what they're doing. What's even cooler is this engineering innovation is taking place here in Bristol, just yeah. over the road. You can see our office. So, so, yeah. Yeah. so go for it. So these guys are around here. They also support the meetup groups. Um, but first question before lunch, who wants to kick us off? It's a lot we'll take a photo. It's a lot to take in, right? <laughs> yes, hello. So, um, do some of your services that you're listing up there use the function as a service uh, to operate? Are you asking if we have circular dependencies in our exactly. infrastructure? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, we have a, a, a sort of layering, a strata of, of services, foundational services, and then services that build on top of those. And those kind of circular dependencies are you know, very important, certainly. And it's actually, it prevents us from depending on some services that might be really convenient, uh, but are higher up the stack than us, so we, we end up doing a lot of things that you wouldn't, as a consumer of our cloud, have to do yourself. Cool, all right. This will be different, yeah. <laughs> not this. Um, have you got anything in the area, or are you planning to do anything, to help with an inventory of functions, searching those functions, discovering those functions, um, and all, all the manageability associated with having thousands of functions? Is that like? In, in my experience, that's as yet unsolved. It, it is not a solved problem at all. We are looking at open service broker. We, we're not very far in our thinking on, on that um, as it happens today. We're aware of the gap and we hear it from a lot of our customers. There's, there's not a lot there at the moment. 
I'm going to need some more servers. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I never answered the original question. How many servers? Like, a lot of them are reused. There are pools of things, but there are well north of 100 servers uh, in that picture. So, yeah, we're going to need more and more and more. Mm. Selling servers, yeah. <laughs> Hi, um, you mentioned a number of uh, black box solutions like API gateways, web application firewalls. Are you able to share what some of those are? Well, <laughs> <laughs> they're all services that are being developed within Oracle. Some of them, I don't know the exact rules. And I don't want to get in any trouble. Some of them you can find out the details but through uh, announcements of companies that we've acquired. So web application frame firewall. Web application firewall, uh, Oracle acquired a company called ZenEdge that had a public uh, product that does that. They're very open about the fact that they use Nginx internally. Uh, but a lot of the kind of details that we've hand waved over are like trade secret kind of stuff. So come and ask us afterwards about specific <laughs> things. When we're not we'll, being recorded. And, and we'll let you know uh, as much as we can. <laughs> You mentioned uh, data plane control plane from the sort of uh, network world. Were there any other engineering practices you found useful, like supervision hierarchies in the Erlang world and that sort of thing? That, that, that's a great question. Yeah. You've heard um, this, um, <laughs> yes, ev everywhere. I don't, I, I'm not sure if I can give specifics, but you've heard this quote, haven't you? That. Um, if I've seen further than others, it's because I stood on the shoulders of giants, but in computer science, we stand on each other's toes. There's like <laughs> tons of incremental stuff that's built up over, over and accreted, and good practices emerge. And, and certainly, uh, um, yeah, those, those kinds of practices do exist. I'm not, I'm not going to give any examples off the top of my head. But yes. I think one, one concrete example might oh, cool. be um, like testing, being very careful to understand our performance characteristics under realistic load at an early stage, and that's practice that's come out of um, hardware engineering. Cool. Hi there. Um, I just want to talk whether you could talk a bit about sort of managed server identity, and if I want to get at something in your uh, key vault, um, where does the password live, and can I trust your uh, managed server identity? Are you taking notes about <laughs> Um, yes, so uh, we, the, the key management service is backed by uh, hardware security modules and you are given a direct connection to those, uh, to those hardware security modules. So you can do remote attestation of, of that hardware. Um, whether you trust remote attestation or not is, is kind of up to you. I think you had it. the problem of where's the first key stored in order to unlock the something or other. So that's kind of where it's getting at, that sort of rabbit hole thing that people talk about. So actually all of our deploys by to a production environment are initiated using the key of like a, an engineer who's responsible for that deploy. Right, so they'll, they'll make a request, that, and that's, that's the seed key. They'll make a request that is signed using their private key, their private key which has been granted access to the to process uh, to do crypto operations using the keys in the vault. You yeah, another question? Cool. Hold on, we need to give you the microphone first because uh, for the recording. Thank you. A lot of providers obviously strive for that 99.9999999% uprate. How do you monitor your systems to make sure you're not losing any of those really important nines? <laughs> like the, the end nines, Tom. Uh, so, a couple, couple of different ways. There's, so we have um, a Canary metric, which sits out Canary system, which sits outside of, completely outside of our infrastructure, um, and performs user-like requests on it, so that we can get uh, indication of when customer requests might be failing. Um, but really, that kind of thing is. Down in the details, we have we have we have metrics at every layer of the stack, um, and some of them are going to be useful to us for 
predicting a certain type of failure, and some of them are going to be informational to us after the case. And it's really doing that detailed level of engineering to understand those, understand those metrics and how they, chip, how they vary and which ones are likely to be predictive of failure um, that, that let us keep that availability up. Mm -hmm. Matthew talked a bit about some of the patterns we use, you know, keeping the control plane and the data plane highly segregated, um, and, and the high availability patterns that, that help us with that. Do you want to mention anomaly detection as well? Yeah, so yes, so we, we do do an anomaly detection off our, off our metrics in, a, in an automated way, um, as well as off our logging to, to detect um, like security uh, type incidents. I think we have time for just one more question if anybody's got burning. Everyone's, everyone wants to get first in the queue. <laughs> <laughs> right, so. Oh, okay, oh, cool. Always Go on. Just a good one. Um, how does it differ from the Amazon service? See you around the back after. Good one. <laughs> uh, that, that's a great question. Um, it's, yeah, so it is. It is. I, I, t I talked about some of it in, in terms of the, the infrastructure that we build on. Because we have this, um, this fantastic high-performance non-blocking network, that lets us... Um, keep our latencies low and predictable so that our, our, our latency distributions are really tight and have um, small tails. This is really important in a functions world where one user request can fan out to hundreds of function or service requests. You're always going to be paying the, the tail latencies, the worst case latencies. So having um, low latencies is good having predictable latencies, small, narrow, tight distributions is better, uh, and our infrastructure that we're building on enables us to do that more effectively. Fantastic. Tom. Yeah. Pat, thank you very much indeed.